I don't think there's any debate about whether or not we have a housing crisis in this country. Rates of home ownership have been falling for some time. The number of people entering retirement either without owning their own home or with a mortgage is rising. Rents are increasing and vacancy rates are falling, which might be great for investors. But this situation is exposing a growing problem in our society. If you own your own home, you might think, phew, I'm glad I'm safe from all this. But are we really? What are the wider implications of our housing affordability crisis? Welcome to The Elephant in the Room. This is the podcast where we love to talk about the big things in property that never usually get talked about. I'm Veronica Morgan, real estate agent, buyer's agent, co-host of Foxtel's Location, Location, Location Australia and author of Auction Ready. And I'm Chris Bates, mortgage broker. Before we get started, I need to let you know that nothing we say on here can be taken as personal advice. We always recommend you engage the services of a professional. Don't forget that you can access the transcript for this episode on the website as well as download our free full or forecast report, which experts can you trust to get it right? Theelephantintheroom.com.au. In this episode, we're welcoming back Michelle Adair, CEO of Housing Trust, a Wollongong-based organisation that builds and manages affordable rental housing for people on very low to moderate incomes. They currently have 1,200 properties providing a safe, secure home for over 2,500 people, employ 43 staff and invest millions in the local economy. Michelle was elected to the board of the Community Housing Peak Body in 2018 and as chair in 2020. Now, we first met Michelle back in 2019, really before this issue was front of mind for anyone outside the sector. And since then, she's been increasingly vocal, raising awareness about the wider implications of a society that does not protect its most vulnerable. We really appreciate you coming back on the podcast today, Michelle. This is becoming, you know, much more obvious as an issue to the wider, you know, population. And and let's sort of get to have a greater understanding of it. It's great to be back. Thank you. Michelle, it's a, it's definitely, um, I feel like at the moment there's lots of armchair sort of forecasters and people having opinions on lots of things without any real on the ground sort of experience and actually seeing what's actually happening. So, you know, how, what over the last couple of years in particular, I mean, how have you seen the situation sort of change in terms of um, in the Illawarra region? And I, mean, I think it sort of highlights the greater issue across Australia and regions and even in our cities. But what, what are you sort of seeing? How's it um, gone in the last few years? Well, regional Australia, more so than most of our capital cities, has seen yep. a massive decline simply in the number of rental properties that are even available. Mm. So yep. most people in the industry, um, you know, forecast that to have about 3% vacancy rate uh, is round about the workable number. Mm. And depending on the community, we have seen that decline to well below uh, 0.5%, 0.2% <laughs> in some communities. Uh, in some places, you know, Yahoo, it's climbing back up to about 1%. But that, of course, still fundamentally means that uh, the rental market is is broken and is failing to meet uh, need. So that's been the first thing. Um, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, in regional communities yep. like the Illawarra, uh, there have been lots of people fleeing the cities. Uh, there's been lots of expats returning. Uh, so there's been a whole range of, of things that have happened. And, of course, the ability for people to be able to work from home uh, has also changed attitudes to where people uh, are able to live and, and work and hopefully you know, manage lifestyles. Mm. Yeah, on the investor front, it's an interesting one to think about. So if, if an investor sold their property in the last few years that they used to rent out in the local rental market in Illawarra because there was this such a big home buyer push and people escaping the cities and looking at more affordable locations, they completely wiped out the investor, right? They, you know, It's highly likely that the investor sold to an owner-occupier and that means there's one less property for rent in Illawarra. Um, and that's-, that's the sort of challenge at the moment is that you know, the number of properties that are available for rent is decreasing, plus also the demand is increasing because people are are moving there. So the scales are really not tipped in the right direction. Chris, that's absolutely one pattern. But the other thing that we have seen in New South Wales, there's a wonderful program called the Community leasehold program uh, where not-for-profit registered community housing providers like the Housing Trust, and there are about 100 of us, you know, statewide and many more uh, across Australia, 
We receive a payment from the New South Wales government um, that allows us to attract properties from private either landlords directly or perhaps mm. through real estate agents. And to be able to use this subsidy payment that we get, uh, in our case, it's a couple of million dollars a year, to pay the gap that a private real estate owner would normally get for their market rent compared to what an affordable housing tenant would uh, be able to afford. And we have had a lot of those properties actually taken back um, by private landlords. And the number right. one reason is that those homes are not necessarily being sold. Yes, that certainly happened. But we're actually having an increasing number of people that say, we're really sorry, but I need this property for my own family. I need this property for friends of mine um, because this crisis is now affecting, as you quite rightly said in your introduction, families um, and communities right across the economic spectrum. Uh, in the Illawarra now, we have uh, aged care providers, uh, personal care um, organisations actually closing down um, services because they cannot attract staff because staff on low to moderate incomes simply have nowhere to live. Yeah. Um, and mm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a growing pattern and trend. So that's been an issue. Um, and we are also seeing another really dangerous trend. To be affordable under New South Wales government rules, we have to rent a property. The starting calculation, there's actually two bits involved. The starting calculation is that it should be pegged at no more than 75% of market. Uh, and then it's adjusted down to make sure that it's between 25 and 30% of, um, of accessible household income. We have seen that gap decline from 70, 75% of market rent to down to about 50% of market yeah. rent in the last couple yeah. of years. And so even for providers like us, our ability, again, in the face of um, you know increasing costs to build, um, acquire land and you know grow our portfolios, as well as being able to attract long-term leasehold properties from the private market uh, in this climate has, uh, has really made our lives even harder. Well, so that... That is, there are a whole bunch of things in there that mm. I hadn't even thought of. One, one is that that yep. your, the pool of money yep. given to you by the government to help people basically shrinking because of that gap is is widening, and so therefore you can help less people. And of course, you because as effectively you're a developer as well in in a way, and so therefore yes, the cost of providing house mm. housing for you as an organisation is going up as well. So that helps you uh, allows you to help less people. Um, one of the things that I was going to ask you about, and then you've also tapped into the labour shortage, and that is a question we want to sort of get into a little bit further on. But yeah. um, one of the things that I guess you're alluding to here is that the profile of people experiencing rental distress is changing, isn't it? Absolutely. We we have just in our community in the Illawarra, we have uh, double income mum and dad, uh, never, never been out of work. So they are mm. still working full time. They have three kids in high school and they are living in a tent in Coromel. Oh, I've got and there is no prospect of them uh, getting a, a, an affordable rental home. They can afford to pay $700, $750 a week, and there is simply nothing for them. This is the new face of homelessness. Yeah. We have acknowledged yeah. for quite some time um, the older women's face mm. of homelessness yeah. um, as mm. being the fastest growing cohort uh, of people in, in really acute housing crisis that typically arrives at... Uh, as a result of, you know, relationship breakdown in, in you know, your 50s and, and 60s, um, couples that have owned a house outright often at that stage, um, mm. by the time you split, split the proceeds, nobody's going to give you a mortgage um, at that age and you simply can't afford to buy anything outright. Uh, in the yeah. current market. So, you know, there's there's a whole round of um, complex and compounding issues. And, uh, you know, we, we are still calling on uh, governments at all levels uh, to take it seriously and to start to pay attention to renters and not just homeowners. I remember discussing... It really feels like a perfect storm, though, doesn't it, for mm. you at the moment? You've got, like... There's nothing really that's coming in, you know, a positive, you know, there's not there's always reasons to be positive, but there's nothing really you can think that is is going to solve this problem in the short term. And, you know, I imagine you're already seeing some investors that 
um, are feeling a bit of stress with their own finances, right? And so maybe they had a property with you, and but then they're going, look, my mortgage is going up. My in, in interest rate on my mortgage for my investment property is going to go up. If I take this back to the private market, I'll get double the rent. You know, I've got to look after myself. And I think you're probably finding that challenge as well, where interest rates are causing households to be more stressed. So they're less willing to help other people, I guess. Is that what are you starting to see that as well? Uh, yes and no. I think we need to be really careful about challenging the paradigm um, that interest rate rises for investors are making a huge difference right now. Um, typically, um, you know, lots of people, when they get around to having, you know, a second property as an investment property, the majority of them are holiday houses. They're people that have already paid off their primary mortgage, you know, and we have to be careful. I've not seen data on it, uh, but anecdotally, um, that's the sort of pattern that I'm seeing. Um, yeah. So, you know, the, the the grand value of negative gearing, I think, needs to be questioned. Um, you know, yeah, private, private property investors are a really easy target uh, for a lot of people in this conversation. Um, but something like 85% of people who own a second property only own one additional property. Quite frankly, we need yeah. those in the rental market. So, you know, yeah, sure. uh, I am I am not going to bag private investors who have got property Properties available, but one of the things we can do um, is uh, is look at um, fast tracking uh, a reform to the tax system. So the housing trust is currently doing this now. A number of our uh, colleagues have already done it. So. Yes, yeah, sure. As a private investor, you can negative gear and, and get that you know get that value if 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 your properties and circumstances yep. stack up. But one of the other things we can do, unfortunately at the moment, it's only by private ruling, which in our case is costing us about $45,000 in about six months just at the moment. We're, we're going through this as an organisation. So we're able to, as uh, a charitable organisation, registered community housing provider under the national regulatory framework, so you know, safe and very legit, um, our organisation and all of our colleagues, are able to say to private investors, um, please rent your property through us, either directly or perhaps still through a real estate agent. And you can claim as a tax deduction that full gap between what you would normally get for yep. market rent and what an affordable housing tenant uh, that we would place in that property would be able to pay. So that's an additional layer and arguably a much more substantial, yes, philanthropic tax deductible opportunity than what negative gearing provides. Um, so one of the things uh, I'm doing now is, is calling on the new federal government to actually fast track that system rather than it costing every charity like ours, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Um, mm. We can do that, you know, in a, in a fast track way just by making it a, a standard tax deductible arrangement. Um, so that's something we can do. Um, the ABS data um, that's starting to come through has highlighted We've got a million vacant properties around Australia. Uh, yeah. That happens to be about the number that we need for um, the affordable housing gap. Uh, in my community in the Illawarra, there are 5,500 empty properties just in the Wollongong Council area. So if we could get a scheme like this up, and we're certainly trying as quickly as we can, if I only got 10% Mm. of those properties. That's 500 homes for people that are otherwise absolutely in crisis. I, th I think it's the vacancy tax is, is, makes so much uh. sense when you've got housing stress, right? If you um, are not using that property, I mean, in any way, right, it's just sitting there in your land banking. Um, you know, you might say, look, if you are using it a certain amount of days per year as a second home or something like that, then maybe you can get around it or you have to provide evidence. But you know, it'd be pretty easy to get that data, especially if you partnered with, you know, electricity and gas companies to show that there's, um, you know, a register there and show that no one's actually living in this property. There's no water getting used. There's no electricity and gas. But are they really um, you, land you, banking or are they um, more likely to have it as, I mean, what's the definition of, of empty? Because I was reading recently about uh, some of the coastal communities where, you know, and and the councils are concerned because there's no real community there either because people will come in, they'll just stay there on the weekend or whatever, and then they'll Airbnb it. And that's been counted as a, as a vacant property because effectively it's not in, it's not part of the community or it's not occupied by people who are part of that community. Um, and there are some councils that are actually starting to tax 
those properties that are on the short-term rental market at a higher rate, you know, the rates are higher um, in order to combat this. So I, I'm not sure how many of them are literally empty, but it's more about the usage. I mean, what is it, those million properties, What are they literally empty? Uh, it looks like they might be. Wow. Um, yeah, that's but yeah, yeah, huge. Ba- based, yeah, based on the ABS data. Now, they could be empty because um, maybe the property's falling down mm. and they, <laughs> yep. haven't, they, haven't got, they haven't got money to fix it. Mm. It's empty because, uh, you know, it's a brand new apartment complex and for whatever reason, uh, you know, the builder didn't yep. build to rent, they built to sell and, you yeah, know, now now the market's, you know, the heat's fallen out of it or they've sold enough um, that it was viable to build but they don't, you yep. know, they're, they're hoping to be able to perhaps land bank, you know, and, and mm. sit on them for mm. a while. That happens. Yeah. We know that sometimes there are properties that – um, are left through estates and they might be either conflicted yep. or the family can't get around to it or they can't argue, you know, they can't mm. agree who's, who's going to do what with it. Um, so, you know, these are the sorts of things that we do need more data on and we do need to understand at really at quite a granular level. Mm. Yep. And that's why having a look at this sort of stuff at, at uh, the LGA is, is an appropriate thing to do. But even within that, so again, my community um, is very different uh, in the north end of the Illawarra. Those uh, historically, wonderfully, you know, boutique mm. small communities that have been fantastic weekenders, you know, places in Thoreau yeah. and Austin Mir, yeah. and thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Very different suburbs to West Dapto, mm. where at the moment there's not even infrastructure for curb and guttering. Um, yeah. And, you know, we have uh, we have local councils saying, oh, we're doing our share for affordability. We're opening up all these new estates. Yeah, but none of them are actually going to be affordable when you're selling a block of land for $500,000, $550,000. Like, give me a break. And, you know, I think that's um, that's been one of the other lessons of the last couple of years is the extent to which these myths are actually completely entrenched mm. and being perpetuated by parts of the property and construction sector that very often have the ear of government mm. um, in a way that is mm. is simply misleading and really, really unhelpful. I think they're two great ideas that can actually impact today and can be implemented really mm. easily. So it's, you know, you know, creating... 50,000 homes down in Illawarra or, you know, regionally it takes years and you've got building and supply mm. and all that sort of stuff and cost and but a vacancy tax, a tax deduction for investors to um, claim the shortfall they potentially could have got on the open market. Um, have you sort of got, uh, you know, superannuation to me is a bit of a, a massive pool that is there for Australians and their, their future and I think that that to me is the pool we should be going to to, um, encourage all our funds to have some type of allocation to providing um, residential assets, I guess. Because um, a win-win for the investor, it's win-win for society, it's, but it's also a win-win for the, the super fund to own the land, to get the land appreciation, etc. Have you done any work around that or had any ideas of whether that's a, a viable option longer term? Yeah, absolutely, and and you're right. Uh, there's a couple of things that make it tricky. Um, yep. The federal government introduced new superannuation requirements that basically say to all super funds now, you have to be able to prove that even your um, ESG ethical investment strategies are maximising uh, member returns. Now, at one level, that's an appropriate and good thing to do um, because we all know increasingly we're going to need our super down the track, which is another reason why I'm so horrified by, again, you know, government policy that says, oh, you know, take your super and get yourself a house. It's just an absolute disgrace. But uh, so that's that's the first hurdle. But there are ways around it. And a number sure. of super funds have actually partnered um, to be able to get around that hurdle. But the other thing that is a challenge is the scale of investment that a superannuation fund is looking for. And a small investment is somewhere in the vicinity of 50 or $60 million. Mm. Um, so, you know, to give you an idea, the Housing Trust's biggest um, project in the pipeline is about 160 homes. Uh, It's land. It used to be an old primary school in Dapto that we've owned for a number of years. That'll yield about 160 homes, um, given the, you know, the LEP and the height limits and density and stuff there. Now, that's going to cost about $95 million. 
Right. Um, so, you know, that's the sort of scale that makes a project attractive for super investment. Yeah. Um, and certainly the industry super funds um, have a, you know, a wonderful tradition and expectation from their members of ethical investment. And so we know that investment in affordable rental housing is a really good thing to do. Mm. There is also growing recognition that affordable rental housing is uh, classified appropriately as social infrastructure and not as residential mm. housing, which is a far more speculative investment class. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, but being being social infrastructure, um, our industry is recognised literally as being as safe as um, investment in schools, um, you know, um, roads. We are social infrastructure. Um, regrettably, the all of the trends uh, suggest that there's only going to be growing demand for our services. Um, it's yeah. not going to lessen anytime soon. Have you thought much about? Have you, have you have you got an opinion on what's happening in Waterloo around the you know knocking down the social towers and then building up a whole new development? And part of that is social. It was like a replacement idea. And what, what's your thoughts on that sort of grand plan? Um, it's an appropriate thing to do. We must renew those awful old estates. However, current government policy, administered in uh, administered in uh, large part through the Land uh, and Housing Corporation through LAC, um, is woefully inadequate in my view. And I am just as publicly critical of the targets that are uh, placed and and realised through Landcom as well. So the uplift of that enormous estate renewal um, in Waterloo is only going to add one hundred social housing units. Oh, wow. Even even the government's independent experts said it should be at least twice that, mm. right? At least twice that. Um, and a community housing provider is not involved, which is a massive lost opportunity and an additional cost to government mm. because as not-for-profit organisations, they are denying the opportunity for us to bring our tax advantages to the deal. So again, that one project is a classic example where private property interests and development interests have just said, you know, government, we can do all this for you. And the government's just rolled over. And it's bad policy, it's bad economics, um, and it, it's just unnecessary. You know, the Community Housing Industry Association and network in New South Wales has delivered multiple times the number of social and affordable housing stock that the Land and Housing Corporation has. Just in a meeting yesterday uh, as a part of Homelessness Week, you know, they're kind of patting themselves on the back that they've delivered 500 homes in 12 months. This is an organisation that currently has something like 130,000. And if they can only renew and that 500 is not a net increase. That includes the renewal of old stock. We haven't had actually published data from the New South Wales government on the net change of social housing stock for years. They actually stopped. We don't know if they stopped counting it, but they've certainly stopped publishing it. And so at the moment in New South Wales, the only organisations that are actually materially increasing the supply of social and affordable housing are the not-for-profit registered community housing providers. We're the only ones. Another huge gap in the government data we've had, of course, as you would well know, the implementation of the affordable housing SEP. Um, for a number of years. So when a builder developer is doing a project, depending on the position and, and some other other local nuances, they can get an increase typically in height and density and some reductions with mm. car parking. If they dedicate an amount of that uh, resulting stock typically they're in unit blocks, Mm. um, to be managed by um, a not-for-profit community housing provider um, under 10-year leases at affordable rent. We have no evidence that any of those approvals that have actually resulted in buildings have also resulted in affordable rental housing stock coming onto the market. I wonder if part of the cause of that has been, you know, in line with our building quality problem. You know, that from a developer's point of view, and this is, has been changing with obviously with our, our building commissioner in New South Wales, who regrettably or sadly has resigned recently. We'll have to see if we we'll try and get him on to yeah. maybe shed some light on that. But um, 
so so if you've got if you have if you're going to retain that that building or part of that building for 10 years you have to make sure that it's actually built to a high enough standard so that that you you're going to stick around and and you know own up to whatever your responsibilities yeah. are I wonder if a bit of that's tied in with that to be honest because I think we've got some really wide wide reaching issues you know in our building and development system in certainly in New South Wales and I know it's it's not perfect elsewhere either um what really is interesting me about what you're talking about, though, there, Michelle, is that, you know, we have had successive governments really fail to address this problem. And also, from what I understand, really reducing the amount of money that is being invested in this this type of social infrastructure. Why do you think, and, and I have to say, my own opinion on this has changed over the years as well. So, you know, I, I can understand how people would have had various attitudes towards social housing and whether it was or wasn't necessary and everything. But why do you think this has been the case? Fundamentally, I think it's because we have um, historically seen the goal of home ownership as a vehicle to increase personal and family wealth. Uh, we have not seen it as that initial fundamental platform for everything else in life. You know, one in three Australians are renting today. Mm. That's that's the number, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I dare say at least nine out of ten of us rent at some stage. When we first leave home, we, you know, we chase, you know, mm. jobs at different times and, you know, for a whole range yeah. of really legitimate reasons, we, you know, we rent rather than buy. Um, so I, I think that's one of the fundamental issues. Uh, we have heard a lot um, that governments of both colours um, have not historically valued renters because they don't see them as being a particular voting bloc mm. or they don't necessarily see them as shifting their vote and p- voting patterns um, in accordance with housing policy. <laughs> uh, that has changed now that there are people from all walks of life and uh, heaven help any political party uh, who goes into the New South Wales election um, next March <laughs> um, ignoring the housing crisis or pretending, as we saw out of Canberra, um, you know, oh, well, doesn't matter, um, you know, home ownership is the solution and, mm. and off you go. Um, so we do have some good policies from uh, the new Labor government, um, but as you, as you quite rightly said earlier, they will take years. You know, mm. if you gave me 5 or $10 million now, I won't be able to hand over – keys to a new home for a couple of years. Um, One of the other things, though, Chris, you know, you were talking a moment ago about what are some of the short-term solutions. Yes, absolutely. Finding ways to tap into this vacant stock is critical. But one of the other things that we've got to be able to do uh, is stop the loss of NRAS properties. So NRAS mm. stands for the National Rental Affordability Scheme. Uh, it was um, it was introduced by the la- last Labor government about 10 or so years ago. Uh, and it, again, provided uh, a Commonwealth incentive payment uh, to private owner developers and also not-for-profits like us to be able to keep stock available uh, at an affordable rent. It absolutely had all sorts of administrative problems and bits and pieces. But we've got about 30,000 households are going to either be evicted over the next couple of years or have their rents jacked up to full market rent. The vast majority of these tenants are retirees on fixed incomes, Mm. okay, Um, and there is nothing to replace it. Queensland is going to lose more than any other state, um, but, you know, the the subsidies are already, you know, coming off um, and that data is terrifying and there is nothing to replace them. So, again, uh, falling on deaf ears, but we have been saying, please find a way of replacing that, even if it's just for another few years, until we can get the benefit of the new housing policy and the new uh, housing fund, this new uh, $10 billion uh, national fund in place. These households are falling off the cliff now so, in thousands. And is that because basically there was a, a 10-year period of time that they had to be offered to you know low-income households and that that time's expiring that's exactly right what's the quantum like how many houses Uh, i i I, 
29,600, something like that. Right, a lot. Yeah. Yep. How long is this? I mean, that's just one element that's going to just sort of tip the scales again, you know, because, of course, yeah. you know, it, it's it's almost like COVID has created this, but clearly this has been a brewing, a storm that's been brewing for a long time. How long would you say this ha- this disaster has been looming for? I mean, where have all the little, this, where did it start? If you like what you're hearing here, please share this episode with others you feel would benefit. And while you're at it, why not leave us an iTunes review? Five stars, please. Every review helps make it easier for other people to find us and hear what our amazing guests have to say. We love hearing your questions and we're planning more listener Q&A episodes. Please send your questions in. You can send them via the website, which is theelephantintheroom.com.au or directly via email to questions at theelephantintheroom.com.au. At least 20 or 30 years, um, we have had uh, economists and academics say for many, many years that governments have always understood what the economy did to the housing market, but they've never paid attention to what the housing mm. market was doing to the economy. <laughs> Mm. Um, and and so that's been that's been the case for decades and and again that's why it's easy for me to be very bipartisan um, mm. because liberal and labor control governments at all levels in all jurisdictions have failed their communities and their constituents to address this we have seen uh, the real quantum of social housing decline from a peak of about six, six and a half percent nationally uh, to below four uh, percent and 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 continuing to decline. Now, that is a group of people who will never be able to uh, rent from the private market and for whom home ownership is um, is is a complete nonsense, mm. you know. Um, so they're people that that live with disabilities, they're people that live um, uh, with a range of um, psychosocial, you know, perhaps uh, problems and, and challenges. So we have always accepted as a society that there are some people um, that uh, have to have subsidised housing and, and have to be supported. That is a human right. Australia does happen to be a signatory to um, the International Human Rights Conventions. And so this thing is protected. Um, uh, and this principle is protected, but it has been disregarded. As I said before, my view is because of the wealth mentality that this is that this is the thing that we have to do. And of course, home ownership is a good and wonderful, terrific aspiration. I've done it. You know, when I lost my home myself uh, through um, through my own experiences of of housing crisis and and being on the brink of homelessness myself uh, when my kids were really little. I get um, the desperation of both that reality mm. um, but also of the desire to get back into the ownership market so that I have a chance of, of having control and, mm. and discretion about my, my own housing security. Mm. And, but, yeah. but that policy position must not be at the expense and the disregard of renters. Um, and and that's where the policy position has failed. So governments have uh, increasingly just withdrawn and said, the market will fix it, the market will fix it. Um, you know, I continue to hear um, consistently, oh, we'll just build more. Well, supply will fix it, supply will fix it. We have never built more homes than we have built in Australia in the last 10 years, and they have never been less affordable. So the Property Council and the UDIA and the Master Builders and, you know, like, can you just stop this rubbish? And governments, can you stop hearing it and believing it? It's just an absolute nonsense. Um, the only way that can su- that supply can make a difference is if it is purposely and then uh, deliberately delivered. Yeah. And protected, I would argue, for at least 20 years. 10 years simply isn't enough. Um, ideally, it would be in perpetuity. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, that's the fundamental structural problem that we have. So and that's what think, I mean. That's, yeah, there you go. I was about to say, do you think that the build-to-rent sector, because that's something that's yeah. starting to emerge, do you think that that's going to help ease the issue or do you think that they that will still be targeting it 
too high. Uh, uh, although too I guess, of course, but even no, if, but, of course, uh, no, yeah, no, uh, it, it, no. Bill to rent is a uh, bill to rent can be a good thing by way of yeah. um, tenancy security uh, because the the stock is mm. is kept for rent. But there's absolutely no interest at all um, in it being secured for affordable rental because if it was, they would be partnering with community housing providers. Yeah. Or they would be registering themselves as community housing providers and making the stock available to meet the government income eligibility and conditional requirements. And it's just not happening. I, and I get that. But if if the build to rent sector then targets the sort of the more moderate income renters and that eases the pressure on you know, the community housing organisations such as yourself, because the stock that you've got, then you don't, well, or even outside that, you don't have private rent, private owners taking the stock away um, because they are catered for by the build to rent uh, model. I guess, can it pay, play a part in that sense, even if it doesn't necessarily focus on, on uh, creating mm. more community housing or more social housing? Um, well, it depends what the rents are. So when, when you talk about moderate income earners, you know, we are talking about early career accountants. We have a real estate agent in uh, one of our properties in mm. Shell Harbour uh, renting. Uh, we're talking about um, early career nurses, all the essential workers, you know, yeah. teachers. Yeah. Um, uh, I had a conversation with uh, with someone who actually um, uh, owns a property in Kayama. Um, they have a self-contained flat, always been airbnb and then they were in their local GP uh, practice uh, last year and heard that that practice had lost its ability to be able to track, attract a doctor to Kayama because that doctor could not find anywhere to rent. Mm. Um, and so, you know, these are the people that are now in, in housing crisis mm. and stress. Um, I have never heard a private build to rent um, uh, construction company owner investor say, I am doing this and I will make the rents available affordably, um, which we know is based on about no more than 30% of household income. Yeah. I, you know. It, to me, it makes uh, so much me sense, email, though, send me, an, send me an email, grab me on yeah. LinkedIn, <laughs> let me know if I'm wrong, but yeah. I don't think I'm going to be bowled over in the rush. Yeah. But, I mean, if you, if you put, provided uh, massive tax breaks to the developer to build this type of um, solution, build to rent makes sense because that's what it is. You're providing long-term mm -hmm sustainable, affordable rentals to this market. You provide massive tax breaks to them. You provide tax breaks to the investors um, with subsidised and you then also attract money from super funds into this space. There's a solution there, right? Um, and, you know, but it's just whether the, the private or the construction companies can sort of see it when they can see they can make money selling it to the private rental market or holding it themselves and charging market rents. And um, I think that's the, the problem is that, no one's going to solve this unless they, they take action, right? And everyone's sort of, you know, shifting it, the blame to someone else. Fundamental marketing, you know, you've, you want to have a customer for your product. Well, guess what? Nobody is being able to afford um, the sort of stock that we have traditionally built in Australia. Um, one of the classics I get from builder developers, oh, Michelle, I've got a great, you know, I've got a great apartment building for you. Everything's two bedrooms, two bathrooms. Like, I don't want that. <laughs> you know, when 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 did when did two bathrooms become a thing in a in a two bedroom apartment? Like, give me a break. So, um, so there's there's lots of stuff there. Mm. Um, but um, you know, we are talking about um, a response to a market failure. The the you know relying on the private market to deliver um, safe, secure, affordable housing to buy, to rent, to live in at scale. Relying on the market to do that has proven over decades yeah. to be a, a fallacy, yeah. okay? So what we're talking about is a degree or degrees of government subsidy because a subsidy is necessary. You cannot have subsidised housing without a subsidy. The only place that that's appropriate to come from is from government. And the only way to do it is through land, through uh, tax concessions um, 
or somehow through uh, through a grants process. You know, they're the options. So you're absolutely right, Chris. Things like tax provisions, things like, um, you know, reductions in fees, things like um, uh, either meanwhile use or uh, in perpetuity transitioning of of um you know government land that is that is either no longer required or or is is just sitting uh, underutilized um are all absolutely appropriate solutions we do know what the solutions are we know what they are in the australian mm. context we have dozens of of models available internationally um and uh, and we need simply Simply, she says, uh, <laughs> leaders with le- leaders, leaders, leadership, particularly from governments, uh, with the courage mm. uh, and the the concern for renters, um, equaled by the courage to stand up to private property interests and say, um, you know, there is a better way, um, and and we can and must do this together. As I said to one of the big developers, it's billing up multi squillion dollar you know project uh, right in central Wollongong um, and I said yeah that's really nice how many how many of the apartments are going to be affordable rental and I said oh well you know how many and, and he sort of looked at me and said well none why would I do that and I said well you've just said that the highlight um, of this location is that you know it's going to be for people uh, shopping downstairs well the shopkeepers uh, and and the rental staff are, are not going to have anywhere that they can live so how are you going to attract them into the commercial bit well you know the hospitality staff that you know you're raving about you know attracting in all these new venues and cafes and restaurants well they're going to be living an hour an hour and a half out of Wollongong so you know what are you going to do about them and there was just this realization that these actually are the people that our economies need and rely on um you know in the in the lead up to the uh council elections last year and uh, also the federal election and we will be doing the same in the lead up to the new south wales election uh we're running a campaign uh that we've called homes for local heroes um to reinforce the fact that these are the people that hold the fabrics mm. of of our mm. communities together, and of course, investing through the not for profit sector. I mean, I I hire and and I want my builders um, to be profitable and to be sustainable and to be in business in another couple of years, um, another ten years, another fifteen years, because I have no intention um, of uh, of going anywhere. And and this problem is growing, and and we have proven, in fact, uh, wonderfully, the housing trust. Um, and just in the last couple of days with our with our one of our partners traders in purple we've just done uh, won a, a national award from uh, the urban task force for our affordable housing project in Coromel, which we opened in october uh, last year which again is more proof of the fact that affordable rental housing um, is beautifully designed mm. wonderfully environmentally sustainable and also delivering a social purpose mm. um, so you know um, it, it Thankfully, uh, we have left behind the hideous old developments of yeah. the past. Oh. But some of mm. our some some of our some of our social attitudes still need to catch up. Yeah, so. it's it is interesting, you know, talking about this because yes, you're right. Our social attitudes need, need to catch up, but it's also you know we've got a lot of discussion at the moment around deficit and the fact that you know coming out of COVID and all that stimulus payments and all this deficit that we're carrying now and it's a lot of negativity around deficit we actually recently interviewed Steve Keen actually the episode economist Steve Keen I think the episode will come out just prior to this one so if you haven't listened to it go back and listen to last week's episode and and you know he's um, advocating for more government debt, right? Which is an interesting, um, and it's very counter, uh, I guess, intuitive, and it's very counter to what is being um, put forward as the ideal, right? And the problem is, of course, we have this resistance to more government debt, and then we need to sort of find out or understand what the payback of that is. What you know, what's what's the benefit in actually increasing the deficit? What's the benefit, and how is the government going to fund uh, more support? But I think the the pitch needs to be, well, what's the what happens if you don't do it? What's the alternative? And I, and I think that that's the reality. A lot of people have been talking about this idea about, you know, your barista won't be able to afford to, to live close to your cafe and you're not going to get, your you know, all your little champagne socialists in the city. <laughs> um, we won't be able to get access to those amenities. And you're talking about in regional towns, you can't get doctors, you know. Um, this this is becoming experienced. You know, there are, there are, I was 
you know, in a very, very privileged sense, I was reading the Good Living in the Sydney Morning Herald on Tuesday and it was talking about restaurants closing down because they can't get staff. And, you know, we all love going out and we're living in our urban areas where, you know, as I said, we can be champagne socialists. But at the end of the day, when it starts hitting people and they start actually saying, oh, oh, this is what it means, then maybe we can start to see some attitude changing. But it's unfortunate, like human nature, until it actually starts affecting us, we're not really going to believe it, are we? No, that's very true. Um, We do know some research that was released by Murdoch University just a couple of months ago said that the failure to address the shortfall in social and affordable housing within the next few years will be costing us $1 billion a year uh, as as a nation. So it does cost us, um, you know, there's, we all know there's good and bad debt mm. um, investing to increase the supply of affordable rental housing. And, and I use that inclusive of social housing. Um, so we know that the investment um, is a massive uh, creator of jobs. We know that it is um, a massive investment and productivity um, mm. boost. Um, you know, we know then that, of course, as social infrastructure, um, we've got, you know, 30, 40, 50 years worth of asset. Mm. Um, Again, it was one of the failed policy perspectives um, of, um, you know, the federal policy that was just like, you know, buy a house, buy a house, buy a house. Um, You know, it's only just a a blink ago that we had the Royal Commission saying, under no circumstances, give people with less than a 10% deposit (laughs) a mortgage. And then all of a sudden, it was federal government policy to do it on 2%. Mm. And these were single parent households, you know, like, oh my goodness, what... What a disgraceful policy position that was, um, and and you know we've we've had off the back of that now um, uh, just this uh, this you know false sense of uh, anything housing purchase related is a good thing. Mm, yeah. So um, we know that the recycling of properties. So every time you know somebody buys and sells an existing home, there's absolutely no positive contribution to GDP or productivity whatsoever. You're just selling it, reselling a used product. It doesn't. It actually doesn't create anything. Mm. But building new homes absolutely um, increases GDP, absolutely um, enables productivity. Um, you know, we, we are often hearing and it seems that we will be requiring large numbers of teachers. We know, of course, in agricultural communities, you know, fruit pickers and uh, agricultural workers and uh, we, we know that we've got big shortfalls in nursing staff and lots of others, uh, lots of other industries. We don't have enough homes today for people that are already here. Yeah. Mm. Where are all these additional people going to live? Yeah. Um, we can't even in most regional communities, not quite the same in, in city areas, we can't even have the volume of foreign university students returning here because they've got nowhere to live. Mm. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the disregard of this looming issue um, is is going to bite and is biting and and it's not going to go away anytime soon. So Michelle, the family- is there a central database of um, people like you that if you've got an investment property, you could sort of type in your address and say, okay, this is the housing provider that's locally that could be a good fit for you to speak to if you don't want to rent it on the private market and you want to rent it in the more of the affordability space? Yes, please. Um, Just jump on the website um, of the Community Housing Industry Association, CHIA, uh, New South Wales, or CHIA in in each other state and territory around Australia, Um, and uh, they will have a list of of all of the not-for-profit community housing providers. Um, And, uh, yeah, those those lists are, are readily available. Most, not all of us, but most of us operate in geographical sort of footprint areas. So, um, you know, most of our work is is in the LOR and the top end of the Shoalhaven. There's there's a different provider in Newcastle, you know, a couple of different ones further west. So, uh, again, that that really adds to the value that we can provide to our local communities and to local landlords um, because uh, we, we know how to look after the assets we know who the tradies are that you know when repairs need to be done and and all that sort of stuff we'll uh we'll include a link in the some links in the show notes for that actually um 
Back to the family, the three, the the family with three children, both of them working, living in a tent in Coromel. What's the prognosis for their situation? Same, same. Dire. So they, there, that's there it. Is, They're going to stay there, like that until uh, for the foreseeable future. Ah, oh, I don't even. Know uh, what to we say. have, you know, there 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 was another case um, uh, of uh, of a single mum with three kids. Um, the oldest of, of, of her children, and, and this is, you know, she she has um, uh, cried out her story uh, in the media, so I'm, I'm not breaching her confidence. Um, uh, her 14-year-old son uh, has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, and uh, so he will he will die prematurely, and he's in a, uh, an electric wheelchair. And her landlord had been wonderful to her. Um, she lived in that home for about seven years. As his mobility, de- you know, deteriorated, they put in more ramps. They, you know, she was allowed with NDIS support to modify the home to to meet his needs. And the landlord said, "I'm sorry, I just need this property back for for my own family. I, I'm really, really sorry." And so there was a massive public appeal, uh, as you might imagine, and and horror. Um, in in our community in the Illawarra about this family's needs, heaps of people saying, you know, his money, his money, his money. Said, I actually don't need money. What mm. I need is a property. Um, and in that circumstance, yes, he was uh, in a wheelchair, so so needed particular adaptations. But um, we find that all the time with older people. You know, if if two stairs may as well be twenty stairs. Mm. Uh, for some people. So um, there is a real need for uh, not just affordable, increasing at scale, increasing the amount of affordable rental housing, but it also has to be appropriate to need. Um, and and interestingly, you know, it's kind of at both ends of the spectrums, you know, one and two bedroom units, fine, but then three and four bedroom houses as well, mm. you know, for families. Um, Michelle, what do you think the role we of councils? We just need lots of everything. What do you think the role of councils have to play in this as well? Because, I mean, you can build more. You can create more houses or apartments um, by encouraging investors to play in this space. Um, you could, But we've got already 10 million dwellings, right? And a lot of those dwellings have a lot of excess rooms, um, excess garages, excess room under the house, you have uh, big backyards that, that could potentially have granny flats on, etc. How do you think councils are sort of creating a problems by having onerous DAs and things that, that, you know, people have to go through to, you know, rent out rooms and then the, and the legal and, and all that sort of situation. I, I feel like that's a, a, a missing trick here where people can get a double win. They get the rental income, you know, by renting out these spaces, but then they don't do it because of the knowledge around that and the council's making it prohibitive. Yeah, look, things like granny flats are one solution. Um, but but I think the first question is, is to pull back. Um, there is unequivocally uh, a role and a responsibility for every local government, so for every council in New South Wales, um, arguably probably across the rest of Australia, but certainly the legislation here in New South Wales, for councils to have affordable housing strategies and plans and to make um, uh, a contribution um, to, to help uh, with, with the supply. To a greater or lesser extent, the majority of councils have said, no, nah, not here, not my, not my business, not my problem. It's a state government issue or perhaps right. a federal government issue. That's actually factually incorrect. They are obligated under the Local Government Act to be proactive to assist with housing affordability in their areas. So the first thing every local council needs to do is actually have an affordable housing strategy. Um, in in our community, again, it's you know a matter of public record. Um, Wollongong City Council have been working on theirs for eight or nine years. They don't have one. Um, up until last year, Kiama Council's strategy formally was let those people live somewhere else. We don't want them here. Um, uh, Shell Harbour uh, just actually didn't really kind of say much at all. They were relying on the fact that they had increased um, uh, new land areas to, to do yeah. it. Um, yeah. In contrast, Shoalhaven Council, proactive strategy, targets, 
partnerships in the community, um, driving reform at a policy and at a practical implementation level. So, you know, there's just four councils mm. in my patch with four completely mm. different approaches. Um, so uh, the New South Wales government has actually published a six-module toolkit that you can download free from the website that tells you as a council how to just get on and do this stuff. And, <laughs> and you know, it's like, yeah, you know, why are you not doing this? Um, so, yes, absolutely. Uh, every council has a contribution to make. Yes, absolutely. Even as a not-for-profit local charitable organisation, I have never received a favourable response to my application to have my DA fees waived. Um, you know, so I'm charged the same as everybody else um, that's, you know, making a profit out of their developments. And when I say, well, you've got a policy and you've got a form that lets me apply, can you tell me why my application has been declined? And they say, oh, well, no, we just didn't give it to you. So, uh, so yeah, there's a contribution. Some councils actually do have a lot of land um, uh, that could either be gifted or made available under long-term leasehold. Yeah. Um, most of us can afford to build, depending on the on the scale and the site. Most of us can actually afford to carry the cost and the risk of construction um, if we gifted land um, uh, or access to land, and then we can lease it for 35 years. That's about the payback period. 20 to 35 is 35 is better. So, again, um, in the interests of, um, you know, really genuinely respecting the needs and the requirements of councils, uh, they don't have to give away their assets. They've, they've also got probity <coughs> rules and regulations mm. that, of course, we respect uh, and that need to be honoured. These are public assets after all, but they are community public assets and these are um, the people in their communities and the small businesses and big businesses in their communities that are hurting. So, again, for legislative reasons, moral reasons, economic reasons, every local government in New South Wales should be mm. proactively engaging um, uh, to find out what they can and should do uh, yeah. to uh, to make a contribution to this And, issue. I mean, the, the, the recycling of assets, you know, you see in the city of Sydney, um, they're selling businesses, like, uh, not businesses, but land holdings like the Sirius building and, you know, a lot of the... Um, houses around sort of Mil uh, Milsons Point, et cetera. Um, and the idea is that we're going to sell that, create that money, and then we're going to go and build affordable housing in other locations. Do you see that that's just a little bit of um, talk and they really don't, you know, fulfill what they set out to? They just make their money on the sales and the money just sort of gets washed with everything else? Uh, yes, and probably almost. Um, I guess the we know that... Um, some supply is created, some more social housing and, to a lesser extent, affordable housing is created as a result, but we know it's nowhere near yeah. enough. Mm. Um, so, again, you you know, you know, spoke specifically about the Waterloo Project. To only get an additional 100 homes, mm. there is an absolute disgrace. We need 50,000 in New South Wales. Yeah. Um, so, um, uh, yes, of course, um, those old building estate um, you know, renewal projects are critical. Um, we've uh, we've just turned soil uh, in a wonderful, probably the most mixed tenure development in New South Wales, um, possibly in Australia. Uh, bottom end of Crown Street, um, it's uh, ground floor commercial, a total of about sixty five apartments. So that's uh, a, a program that the New South Wales government's no longer pursuing. Um, again, like all things, it, it would have been much more successful with a few little tweaks. Essentially, what they sold, what they've done is, is sell land that previously had some 50 red brickers on it. They became vacant over a period of time. They sold them to a private developer in return for um, more social housing stock and um, some affordable housing stock. Great model, and the rest of it mixed tenure, so market stock. So we were successful um, as the uh, as the community housing partner to manage the social stock for government. Um, and as it's turned out, we have also been in a position to buy the affordable housing stock, which might otherwise have been purchased by an investor. So uh, we will be managing 
tenancies in that building where social housing tenants will be paying less than $100 a week in the same building where penthouses have just sold for $2.4 million. I think I saw your media release uh, on that. <laughs> it was a, yeah. a nice angle. Mm. Yeah, and and so, um, you know, and we, we've had some of those investors. So we were really proactive and, and engaged and Bell Property happened to do the sales. So I met with, with all the Bell Property people and said, well, this is who's moving in and this is uh, these are the circumstances and this is who we are as a property manager and, you know, all that sort of stuff. We actually had buyers in that building um, commit to being spokespeople for inclusion rezoning and to talk about how mm. these sorts of mixed tenure buildings are really good and positive things to do. So, again, it is unacceptable for the New South Wales government to renew estates like Waterloo and Redfern and, you know, so many parts mm. of the inner west in Wollongong, Balambi, Warrawong, Mangerton, yeah. uh, Minto. It is unacceptable for them to not renew those estates with massive increases and uplift in social and affordable rental supplies, a proportion of them. Well, I'm hoping that as this becomes louder and louder as an issue, as you become louder and louder too, <laughs> educating us all about this, and this has been a great conversation. Absolutely. You know, hopefully our governments will start responding. I mean, you know, you can see with climate change, and unfortunately things have to get really dire before people vote accordingly and hopefully this doesn't have to get any more dire before uh, you know voters can start putting pressure on governments and therefore policy has to to change so um thank you so much for your time again michelle i've you know it's it's really great to get the insights you provide for us um, and we hope our listeners really appreciate that as much as we do if you're looking to buy your dream home or an investment property in Sydney's inner west, eastern suburbs or North Shore, my team and I can help you buy without regrets. Reach out via my website, gooddeeds.com.au. If you're looking to buy your first home, thinking of upgrading into a new one or purchasing an investment property anywhere in Australia, my team love to carefully guide you on this journey and most importantly, get the finance right. Reach out via our website, wealthful.com.au. Thanks for joining us. We'd love to see you again. And remember, don't be a dumbo.